I'm very pleased to welcome you to this IIEA webinar. We're delighted to be joined today by Dr. Theo Tilly Canan, Director of the European Centre of Excellence for Countering Hybrid Threats, who's been generous enough to give her time out of her schedule to speak to us. Um, she'll speak for us to us for about 20 minutes or so, and then we will go to a Q&A uh, our audience. You'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on the Zoom, which you should see on your screen. Please feel free to put questions in throughout the sessions as they occur to you, and uh, we'll come to them at the end. We'll ask the doctor then when she's finished her presentation uh, to with them. Just a reminder that today's presentation and Q&A are both on the record, and please feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle Twitter uh, that is at IIEA. I now formally introduce Dr. Tilligan, um, who is the Director of the European Centre of Excellence for Countering Hybrid Effects. Previously, she was the Director of the Finnish Institute of International Affairs from 2010 to 2019, and has been the Director of the Network of European Studies at the University of Helsinki from 2003 to 2009. And in 2018, she became and was nominated part-time professor at the European University Institute School of Transnational Governance in Florence. She served as Secretary of State at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Finland from 2007 to 2008. And she was a member of the European Convention in 2002 and 2003, and a member of the panel and eminent persons of European security as a common project in 2015 and 2016. Doctor, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much uh, for this kind presentation. And, uh, uh, and I also would like to thank uh, the organizers for this opportunity to uh, address uh, this distinguished audience. Uh, I will talk about a, a topic uh, that during the past couple of years has uh, surfaced uh, European political discussion uh, hybrid threats, uh, what are they, uh, how do they affect uh, the security of our societies, uh, what happens to hybrid threats uh, when there is a, a huge uh, conventional threat in the, in the form of the war against Ukraine going on, uh, what have we, have we seen and, and experienced during this, this half, half a year uh, in, in these terms. Uh, I am representing a center of excellence, which is an international intergovernmental uh, center of excellence uh, located in, in Helsinki, where the, the key task uh, of the center and its experts is to provide information, analytical knowledge, uh, expertise about these hybrid threats. Uh, and I will structure my, my presentation in the, in the following uh, way. I will start uh, by paying attention to the notion of hybrid threats. Uh, hybridity, hybridity meaning mixed form, mixed, mixed form of, of something. So what, what, what does this refer to in the case of, of uh, security threats? Uh, I, try to put hybrid threats into a, a context, asking how come that these threats have become so very topical now during the past uh, few years? Uh, and what do we need uh, as, as democratic societies to do in order to, uh, to address them and, and protect our societies from these threats? And, and last, I'm going to focus a little bit on our center, uh, tell about its work and activities during these five years uh, when the center has exist, existed. It, it established, was established in, in the spring 2017. So now I would uh, like to use uh, my, my slides and we can, this is the uh, topic of my presentation and we can move to the, to the first slide which, which brings light to the concept. <clears throat> when we uh, refer to hybrid threats uh, in the context of European security or broader, broader global security, uh, we refer to threats of a very specific type. It is 
uh, malign activity caused by state actors or non-state actors, uh, which in most, most cases uh, are, are kind of meant to do harm to democratic states and societies. Uh, what is typical of, of hybrid threats is the set of instruments and tactics that are being used. So when I when I say here that uh, hybrid in, in hybrid threats it is question of un unconventional means that are being used, uh, I refer to means that are not typical of, of those means that tend to be used in the international uh, context, political, economic, or military means uh, for power projection or, or promotion of one's own, own, own interests. These threats are unconventional. Uh, we talk about cyber attacks, cyber means being a, one of the key tools in this context. Uh, we talk about attacks and disturbances of, of critical infrastructures, access to energy, electricity, uh, which, which of course are very topical today, uh, critical sea lines of communication. We talk about uh, disinformation campaigns or, or, or more broadly manipulation of the information space. We talk about instrumentalized migration, uh, a phenomenon which we saw last year uh, at the borders of Belarus and, and its three European neighbors, EU neighbors, Lithuania, Latvia and, and, and Poland. Uh, we talk about asymmetric for, forms of, of uh, warfare, hybrid, hybrid warfare as, as, as we call them. Uh, so many unconventional means uh, where uh, the target is, is, is uh, a, a democratic uh, state or society and uh, weakening of that, that state is, is the key goal of, these, of the use of these activities. Uh, from our center's point of view, we, we tend to uh, mention that these unconventional means, means usually are used in concert as a kind of different tools or set, different tools, different instruments are being used at the same time. And, uh, and the activity is planned so that they are exploiting the vulnerabilities of the target country. So this is very much in a nutshell what we are referring to. And these kinds of uh, kind of the use of these kinds of tools has become very, very common uh, in, in today's international environment, just because they are so cost efficient as, as cost, effic cost effective, cost efficient as we, as we tend to argue. Uh, in comparison with normal military instruments, in uh, comparison with normal political or diplomatic tools, it's, it's uh, much cheaper to, to carry out a kind of a, 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 a cyber uh, attack or, 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 produ or, or produce a, a disinformation campaign. Still, it's, it tends to have, have serious consequences for the, for the target society. Uh, soon, when uh, I'm, I put them into a context, I will, uh, I'm going to tell that the reason why they are, uh, have become so very common uh, relates to the cu current international uh, environment where there is a major uh, rivalry uh, going on between democratic states on the one hand, authoritarian uh, regimes on the other. It is uh, rivalry about values about models of governance, about leadership ship of the international order. So this is uh, the context in which uh, these kinds of threat instruments belong. Uh, and we can already at this stage mention that uh, when we look at uh, the political documents or doctrines of, of the key authoritarian states, Russia and China, we find these instruments there. They are a part of, of the so-called Russian political war. This is the Russian uh, term uh, and the understanding of the Russian uh, thinking is that Russia is in a kind of broad scale war against the West. The Russian argument being that the West is the one that attacks and that's why uh, Russia has to use uh, the full scale of instruments to defend itself 
against the hostile hostilities of the West. And in the Chinese case, there is a similar termino terminology. Uh, the, the, the concept that is used by China is the indirect war and uh, where the, the whole Chinese uh, society, public and private actors have to form a united front to defend China, its political and cultural unity against uh, Western uh, host hostilities. So the argument, uh, <laughs> the justification for, for the use of these tools is given in, in these doctrines. Uh, we can take my next slide, please. Uh, so they are they they become have become a commonplace tool uh, in this rivalry, uh, where the non-Western authoritarian uh, states uh, are are competing about a, a leadership position uh, at the international level, where we have a a transition in the global balance of power ongoing. Uh, the arguments of the of the authoritarian regimes, Russia and China, being that uh, that it should be the end of the Western uh, political hegemony, uh, the international system should be more democratic, more multipolar, uh, that their values should play a larger role uh, in the in, in the current international order. Uh, this is this is uh, the the argument. Uh, uh, there is a something that we call the systemic rivalry uh, and the of course uh, the vulnerabilities of the authoritarian systems play a role uh, vulnerabilities which mean that when authoritarian regimes can be cannot be renewed uh, in the normal democratic way uh, the legitimacy of the of their of their governments of their regimes have to be safeguarded by by using other types of means exactly the external uh, campaigns uh, weakening the 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 democracies, discredi discrediting the democratic model, uh, changing the international power structure to their own benefit. Here functions also as a tool for for the domestic uh, survival of the authoritarian uh, regime type. We should also, of course, take into account that the modern technological developments. Uh, <laughs> creates a, 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 a or forms plays an into, impo, important role in this context there are much more new facilities platforms and potential for uh, adversarial activities and the use of these uh, these uh, hybrid tech tools and already the cost efficiently uh, co cost efficient uh, character of them was mentioned so let's move to my next slide please <clears throat> Uh, in the Center of Excellence, we are looking uh, at various cases of, of, uh, of, of hybrid threats, where various forms of hybrid threats, but we are also looking at trends. Uh, so so what, what, what kinds of trends do we see in, in certain geopolitical fields, in, in certain functional fields of, of society? Uh, these are certainly no uh, new news for you. Uh, but I just wanted to pick up some trends, mainly to to pay attention to the very uh, to the diversity of of, of of hybrid threats today. So we have we can divide them uh, uh, on the basis of the time span. Uh, there are those kinds of uh, threats that are more immediate, uh, and then there are threats that we call as as uh, call us or, or described to be at the, at the priming stage, so pave the way for a later operation or attack, uh, preparing something. Uh, well, just to, to mention uh, some trends, uh, we have seen uh, during the past couple of years a, an intensifying uh, hacking uh, against Western governments and parliaments their information systems. We can ask ourselves what's the, what, what, what is the kind of ultimate goal with these kinds of attacks. Uh, in most cases, it, it, is, uh, it is not that clear if, if, it's, if the, the hackers are after the kind of information that they then, uh, confidential information or personal information that they then 
plan to, 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 to uh, leak or publish at, at the later stage, or if it's just to increase the psychological pressure uh, on societies uh, by attacking the kind of the heart of the democratic government, parliament, uh, the governments, this, this has become very uh, uh, frequent. Um, if, if, the, if the goal is to uh, decrease uh, trust in, in, in the government in that country or, or, or polarize uh, public opinion, very difficult to know. A very, very different trend of hybrid threat activity that we perceive uh, takes place uh, in, in the uh, kind of at the company level uh, within critical infrastructures where we see a kind of uh, dependencies, increasing dependencies uh, created by, by in particular uh, Chinese actors uh, and, and the Chinese uh, government uh, where, where increasing uh, foreign ownership, Chinese ownership of Western critical infrastructures uh, is, cannot be described as a hybrid set at, as such, but in, in our understanding, uh, kind of uh, paves the way, creates a lot of dependency and, and potential for future uh, hybrid set activities, which would mean that these, these, uh, this ownership, these critical infrastructures, these dependencies that have been created uh, would start to be used politically against uh, the countries and governments where they take place. And this, of course, has already been seen in, 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 in some, some cases. This seems to be a systematic trend. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it's linked with the Chinese New Silk Road project, uh, the Arctic Silk Road or the, the Central Asian Silk Road, uh, similar activities taking place in Africa and Latin America, but also in the heart of, 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 of Europe. Uh, as a part, I, I already mentioned earlier that we, when we talk about hybrid threats, we refer to both, both state actors, but also non-state actors, where non-state actors, all from private companies, different political groupings, terrorist organizations, just groups of hackers uh, are, are being used as, as proxy actors for state actors. We see more and more uh, different types of, of non-state actors that uh, promote the agenda and, and interests uh, of, of state actors, or from the Wagner Group, private military companies, religious communities, uh, to, uh, to private sm uh, smaller private companies that have been established just to uh, kind of uh, take care of a com commercial activity for a, uh, for a state actor. Uh, so this this really is is, is a is a crucial ten, a trend among among hybrid threat activities. Uh, of course, uh, two uh, a little bit newer uh, phenomena related to hybrid threats can can be described as first as as the use of lawfare, which I will explain, and and the instrumentalized migration that I already mentioned. Uh, so lawfare. Uh, is a term which refers to the political and, and strategic use of law uh, to the benefit of a, of a hybrid uh, threat actor. If uh, we think about law in its uh, commonplace role, uh, it is an element of stability, uh, predictability uh, at the international level as well as at the national level. If then law and legal frameworks are being used not uh, in, in, in that role, but, but rather, rather in the role of, of promoting a, a state interests, uh, law it gets, gets a very diff different function. Uh, this, this is what we see uh, in man many uh, maritime environments where the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea is, is uh, kind of artificially interpreted uh, very much against this, its ori original spirit uh, uh, to promote uh, state interests in, in, around the, in East uh, China, South uh, China Sea, or in the Arctic, or, or even in, in the Baltic Sea. This might uh, imply the use of uh, kind of the legal use of military exercises uh, to, to block critical sea lines of communication, access to ports or harbors, 
uh, as an example uh, among many others. And instrumentalized migration, where migration and the uh, commitment of Western states to international humanitarian rules and conventions is being uh, exploited as a vulnerability and uh, the mi the migration uh, is, is, is used as a, as, a, as a tool to enhance uh, polarization, instability in target societies. As we have seen in 2015 in, in my country, Finland, uh, a, a Russian operation, uh, the same year uh, against Norway, and as mentioned last year by Belarus to, to three uh, EU, EU countries. Just mentioned a couple of trends to, to, to uh, give you an impression of how, how di diverse uh, and very different the hybrid threat activities can be. Can we go to my next slide, please? And now I try to be very brief with the next two, two slides, just uh, addressing the phenomenon on, on, uh, from the point of view of how we can counter, counter uh, these threats, uh, how we can uh, protect our societies, enhance our own security. Uh, basically, we are talking about two main tools uh, in very broad terms, we are talking about uh, societal resilience, building broad societal resilience. Uh, and, and here I give you the definition of resilience, uh, which, which is an ability to adapt to exceptional conditions, to absorb and recover from a shock. Uh, resilience is being built uh, at the national, local and, and even international level in the framework of the European Union and NATO, for instance. Uh, both by using legis legislative instruments, new laws, also policies. Uh, we need to pay increasingly attention to, to our information space, for instance, uh, against uh, to counter this, this uh, disinformation campaigns or, or broader manipulation of information space. But we also need to prepare our, our populations and societies to, to, to address uh, this phenomenon that takes so multiple multiple forms, and, and that's where we are talking about psychological resilience. Of course, common situational awareness, common understanding uh, between the private sector and public sector uh, about uh, the big picture that I, I tried to uh, describe to you that the, the hybrid threats uh, relate to, and uh, the kind of uh, tactics uh, that their specific tactics, uh, which they by, by means of which they, they try to exploit vulnerabilities in our our democracies, our values kind of bring our values against us. And the uh, next slide uh, mentioned another uh, mentions another tool uh, which for for a long time was was a little bit uh, distant at least from from the small states amongst us. Uh, when we now talk about a, an effective policy of deterrence, uh, that deterrence does not uh, refer to nuclear deterrence, uh, where, where the concept originally comes from. But uh, in addition to, to resilience, we must also uh, create, uh, take into use more proactive tools to signal uh, the countries that uh, that are targeting us, uh, that there will be a cost uh, on, on their behavior. And this is exactly what we are doing at the EU level, at the national level, by, the, by imposing sanctions, by uh, strengthening our own uh, narrative and, and the willingness, uh, messaging the, willing, the common willingness of us to, to protect our, our societies in the, in the, in the broad in a broad manner. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, uh, I'm fast now with, with these slides because I, I want to use the remaining couple of minutes uh, on, on the hybrid center of excellence, which, uh, we, which we then can also uh, discuss more in detail in the Q&A session. But I could take my next slide and, and present the center of excellence to you. So we are talking about currently about the center of the size of 31 countries. On Wednesday, we will uh, in fact get our 32nd participating state. This center was established in Helsinki 
five years ago, as I mentioned, and then uh, there were 11 members. Uh, the understanding behind that establishment was that as these threats are, are so different, diverse, and uh, as we really have to understand their logic, uh, we have to cooperate closely uh, as, as uh, democratic states, but also uh, strengthen cooperation between the key uh, intergovernmental bodies, the European Union and NATO. We, we have to kind of right, find the right instruments to, to counter hybrid threats and, and those instruments need to take place at, at different levels, as, as said. Uh, so the center was established to, uh, to kind of enhance this understanding and, and awareness and uh, expertise uh, by those 11 states. And, uh, and when Malta uh, joins on Wednesday or uh, confirms its accession that we already place earlier, uh, we will be 32 countries uh, and, and the center covers a, a major part of the European Union and NATO then. And the next slide will show you uh, how we function here. Uh, so the secretariat where we are around 40 experts, uh, we are fo focusing on these different forms of hybrid threats. We are focusing on the uh, the state strategies as, and, and policies that create these threats against our societies. Uh, so 40 experts uh, uh, representing 17 different nationalities, as we have a lot of seconded experts here in our, our secretariat, mostly with people with civilian backgrounds, some, uh, some people with, with military backgrounds, uh, academic experts, as well as experts from, from the government. The center is funded by its participation fees. Uh, Finland, as the host country, pays half of our core co budget, and the rest comes then from the uh, from the other participating states. We do a lot of uh, different types of uh, an analytical activities. We publish a lot of uh, on on our website public publications, but also also publications with limited release. We provide. Uh, tabletop exercises and different types of trainings to the administrations uh, and uh, do capacity building in, in other forms. But of course, we also work closely with the European Union and NATO and try to facilitate their mutual cooperation as, as it is a part of our, our mandate. Uh, we are not uh, uh, a part of EU or NATO. We are an independent or autonomous uh, center of excellence. Of course, we are led by, if we take the next picture, I, we are, uh, we are, we are uh, led by a steering board, as, as you can see, consisting of representatives of the, of the soon 32 participating states. And, and you see the flags there and you see our units uh, with, with kind of green color and then the administration uh, with its teams uh, with, with blue color. Of course, uh, we have, uh, I have been in this position since autumn uh, 2019, and there has always been a close cooperation with Ireland. We have had uh, important visitors uh, from Ireland and, and uh, it has always been a, a pleasure to, uh, to cooperate even if, if Ireland is not a, a, a participating state for the time being. My final slide, I have used some extra minutes now, but I wanted to just kind of uh, uh, show light uh, on, on, on the kind of three dimensions of our, our work, just to make the picture clearer for you. So we look at these th threats. How do they look like? Uh, what, what is the peculiarity with hybrid threats? What, what is the kind of their, their specific tactics because they, they it's a very tactical instrument when they want when they are, are targeted against the vulnerabilities in our democratic societies freedom of speech our uh, commitment to human rights norms uh, kind of free media environment this is this is what is being uh, exploited there we look at hybrid threats in in specific uh, geopolitical regions such as the arctic or, or the mena region last year this year we are focusing on, on the Eastern Partnership countries. 
but we are also, as, as the second uh, section here shows, we are focusing very much on the on the authoritarian states and, and, and their philosophies, their approaches to these hybrid threat instruments in order to be able to, to, to counter them. And we also pay attention, increasingly attention to, to the non-state actor, uh, the use of non-state actors to kind of, to, to try to block also that route from being used. And finally, the core of course is to, uh, bring, create knowledge about our vulnerabilities. Uh, and that's where we also focus on, on our democratic processes. Uh, we counter election interference, uh, counter foreign interference in our democratic uh, processes and, and debates. Now, I, I'm sorry I used a couple of extra minutes. I'm very happy to answer and address any, any types of questions and comments. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you.